In this video, I'm going to continue the discussion on the ideal of pure reason. And in this one, I'll actually get to Kant's refutation of the ontological existence for God. Uh, in the video after this one, uh, I will get into Kant's refutations of the cosmological argument and the argument from design. So Kant uh, first uh, wants to give some motivation for why this sort of ens realissimum, this this highest being, uh, is seen as a candidate for uh, for God. So reason can often see through the illusion that the objective existence of this concept of all predicates, which I've been calling omega, is not entailed by the ideal of omega. But since reason seeks a necessary being to explain all of contingent being and seeks a candidate that is compatible with necessary being, it often finds omega to be a suitable candidate. Uh, so this is because being so complete, so all other concepts being deficient insofar as they are determined by limitations, uh, omega does not require any further condition and therefore is unconditioned. Uh, Kant says, however, that if we accept the, f even if we accept the following two things, uh, an unconditionally necessary being exists, and that omega is an absolutely unconditioned being, we are still not warranted in saying that omega is the unconditionally necessary being, since a limited being. Uh, where we are limiting it, uh, limiting the set of all possible predicates by some subset of those predicates uh, here with phi uh, does not contradict absolute necessity. Uh, so uh, because if omega contains within itself all the conditions, uh, but some object that is limited here does not, it does not tell us that the conditioned cannot exist. For instance, in a hypothetical syllogism, uh, so if A uh, and B and C and D or not D, uh, then, uh, you know, psi, uh, so condition D is possibly missing, and then we say, you know, A and B and C and not D, uh, then phi. And so we're saying that, uh, that Kant is saying that this uh, could still condition, uh, could still be sort of the the unconditioned condition here. Uh, so Kant says there are only three possible ways that reason can attempt to prove uh, the existence of God, uh, but that reason fails in all three. So these are the ontological argument, the cosmological argument, and the argument from design. He then proceeds to go through each of these three arguments in turn. Uh, and so Kant's refutation of the ontological argument is, uh, you know, one of his most uh, sort of popular things, probably one of the most uh, most popular part of the entire uh, transcendental dialectic. And the reason for that uh, is, as we'll see in the next video, Kant says that the cosmological and the argument from design uh, both end up sort of depending on the ontological argument. Uh, and so the failure of the ontological argument uh, also entails the failure of the other two arguments. Uh, so in this video, I will talk only about the ontological argument. Uh, so what he's responding to is actually uh, Leibniz uh, ontological argument, and Leibniz was actually responding to Descartes' ontological argument. So I am actually starting from Descartes here. So Descartes' ontological argument is uh, is put right here. So I have an idea of a supremely perfect being, i.e. a being having all perfections. Necessary existence is a perfection, therefore a supremely perfect being exists. Uh, so Leibniz said uh, in his uh, Proof of God's Existence from His Essence uh, that Descartes' ontological argument only proves the conditional statement, if God is possible, then God exists, but must, but must go further and show that God is possible. 
then complete the following syllogism. If God is possible, then God exists. Uh, God is possible, therefore God exists. And so Leibniz argued for this in the following way. So if the necessary being is possible, then it actually exists. For if we assume that it doesn't exist, then one may reason as follows. Uh, by hypothesis, uh, the necessary being doesn't exist. And so this is sort of uh, trying to show a proof by contradiction here. Uh, so whenever something doesn't exist, it possibly doesn't exist. Uh, so, you know, something not existing means that it's possible for it to not exist, which, you know, possible for something to not exist is just sort of the, the uh, converse of possibly existing. Uh, whenever something possibly doesn't exist, it is falsely maintained to be impossible not to exist. Whenever something is falsely maintained to be impossible, uh, impossible uh, not to exist, uh, then it is falsely maintained to be necessary, for necessary is what is impossible not to exist. Therefore, the necessary being is falsely maintained to be necessary. Uh, this conclusion is either true or false. If it's true, it follows that the necessary being contains a contradiction uh, or is impossible because contradictory assertions uh, have been proved about it, namely that it is not necessary. For a contradictory conclusion can only be shown about a thing which implies a contradiction. Uh, if it's false, necessarily one of the premises must be false, but the only premise that might be false is the hypothesis saying that the necessary being doesn't exist. Hence, we conclude that the necessary being either is impossible or it exists. So if we define God as uh, the being from whose essence is is, is existence, uh, it follows uh, that a necessary being, it follows that God, if he is possible, actually exists. And so Leibniz here thinks that he has proven that if God is possible, uh, then God exists. And he, well, he actually thinks that he's shown that God is possible. And since we set up here that if God is possible, then God exists. Uh, and we are in, Leibniz says that God is possible and therefore God must exist. Uh, and so I actually took this uh, long syllogism here from this paper I found online. So uh, by uh, Wolfgang Lenson here, uh, and this is the link to that. Uh, so Kant responds in the following way. So there is a difference between an unconditional necessity and a conditioned necessity. So a triangle necessarily has three angles, but that does not mean a triangle necessarily exists. Uh, you know, so we define a triangle as having three angles, but just because a triangle must have three angles doesn't mean that a triangle must exist. Uh, so instead, it is a conditional. If a triangle exists, then it must have three angles. So nothing demands that triangles therefore must exist. We cannot say if a triangle has three angles, then a triangle must exist. But Kant says, people think that the logical necessity of the proposition, a triangle necessarily has three angles, has been conflated with an absolute necessity, a triangle necessarily exists. But if T, uh, which represents a triangle, has the predicate A, that which has three and only three angles necessarily. So T is A. The negation of the predicate is a contradiction. So T is not A. However, if we say not T is not A, this isn't a contradiction. So if we are saying that, uh, that a triangle, that, uh, so I'll just say triangle has three angles, if this is true, then triangle uh, uh, has has not three angles uh, is a contradiction, but saying that not triangle, so something other than a triangle uh, has not three angles. So something other than a triangle, such as a square, obviously doesn't have 
three and only three angles. Uh, and so if we sort of just negate the subject triangles, we don't run into a contradiction here. So this is not a contradiction. So Kant says the same can be said of God, where the proposition God is omnipotent is, according to Kant, logically necessary. That, uh, you know, the definition of God is that he is omnipotent. So just like the definition of a triangle is that it has three angles. So this, it's necessary that God is omnipotent. It's logically necessary. But if we simply say that God doesn't exist, then neither does his omnipotence, uh, which is not a contradiction of terms. Uh, it is not what Kant calls internally necessary i.e. not God is not omnipotent, is not a contradiction. And God's non-existence with the world's existence is not logically impossible. It is not what Kant calls uh, externally necessary. Uh, the conjunction God does not exist and the world exists is not a contradiction. You know, somebody might argue that it's sort of physically impossible, but it's not a logical contradiction. Uh, so there is a subject which, if his existence were negated, would be logically impossible with the existence. Uh, so there is no subject which, if his existence is negated, would be logically impossible with the existence of the world. Since the negation of the subject automatically negates with it all predicates. So kind of what we see up here uh, and joined to it. In other words, there is no not a, not T is A, since not T is non-existence and therefore cannot contain A or any other predicate because a non-existence doesn't contain any predicates. And so Kant's most famous part of the argument against the, uh, uh, the ontological argument is that if we say that S is, you know, some conjunction of predicates, and that one of the predicates uh, is existing. So, uh, so one of the predicates is essentially that uh, S is existing, existing, or you know, if we wanted to shorten it, S exists. S exists. Uh, then we are making either one of two assumptions. So if we are saying this of something, we're making one of two assumptions. So the first one is that the proposition S is existing is analytic, in which case either uh, either S, the thought in you, is the thing itself. So we're just saying, you know, the thought I'm having exists as a thought, you know, which is, you know, kind of, tautological, you know, the thought I'm having right now exists as a thought. And so uh, we're saying that if this is analytic, then it either means that, or it means you have presupposed the existence uh, as belonging to possibility, where possibility is defined as not containing any internal contradiction. So anything that is not internally contradictory, contradictory is something that is possible. Uh, uh, but it's saying that uh, we're presupposing the existence of something just because it's possible, uh, which is what we already refuted above, that something being possible because of not having any internal contradictions does not imply its existence. Uh, or it could be, uh, if we're uh, if we're saying that S is existing as analytic, that uh, you have made what Kant calls a miserable tautology in assuming that the inner possibility, the non-contradictoriness of S's existing as anything the concept of the subject S. Because if you posit S as real, which contains all its predicates, then adding the predicate is existing is saying something about S that is already posited by saying that it's real. Uh, so when your friend points at a tree uh, that both of you are currently looking at, what is added to the assertion that tree right there by instead saying that tree right there is existing? Uh, you know, because saying that tree right there already sort of implies existing. So adding the predicate is existing adds nothing to it. Uh, or by saying that tree right there is not a contradiction, uh, 
compared with the existence of that tree right there is not a contradiction. So adding the existence of uh, that tree is not a contradiction doesn't add anything to just saying that that tree there is not a contradiction. Uh, so the point being that the predicate existing or exists adds nothing new to the subject. Uh, so that's under the assumption that S is existing is analytic. Uh, <clears throat> but if the proposition S is existing is synthetic, in which case existing is not contained within S, uh, it is not internally necessary, and therefore removing the predicate existing is not a contradiction. And so Kant actually says that uh, that S is existing is a synthetic statement that, you know, this idea that is existing is analytic is sort of uh, is sort of incoherent. And so Kant says, in fact, that all existential propositions of the form S is existing are synthetic. Uh, so one cannot define something into existence by saying, oh, in this S that I just made up has existence as one of its essential properties and therefore necessarily exists. Uh, and so what this means up here is, uh, is you know, that, that, that removing the predicate existing from something does not make any contradiction. So, uh, you know, if I posit a tree and then I say that tree doesn't exist, that's not any kind of a contradiction. Uh, so there's no contradiction there. Uh, but S is existing, the discovering that the tree exists is something that we actually have to go out in the world and actually discover, which makes this a synthetic or empirical uh, proposition. Uh, so the actual existence of the object does not add anything new to the concept analytically, but only synthetically. So that $100 is worth more to me than the concept of $100 is something only known synthetically. Since the proposition uh, 100 actual dollars is worth more than 100 possible dollars is not analytic from just the concept of $100. Uh, in other words, one cannot analyze the concept of $100 and thereby determine that an actual existing $100 is worth more. Uh, so one cannot gain knowledge synthetically just by uh, sort of um, analyzing the concept of $100. So nowhere in the concept of $100, in just the concept of $100, uh, do we discover that 100 actual dollars is worth more than the concept. And so existence does not add anything new to, uh, to some concept. And therefore, we cannot say that uh, a concept is sort of uh, better if we add existence to it. And so this concept, this uh, ends realissimum, this, this omega, this uh, fully, uh, this uh, thing that we've been talking about uh, is not something you can just say uh, it also exists and that makes it sort of uh, better. That's something you can't get by analyzing just the concept of, you know, all of the affirmative predicates. Uh, but anyway, this is Kant's uh, uh, argument uh, or refutation of the ontological argument for God. So in the next video, I will talk about Kant's uh, cosmological argument or his refutation of the cosmological and refutation of the argument from design, which, uh, like I said, Kant ends up saying uh, sort of depends on the ontological argument and so are somewhat derivative of it. Uh, but yeah, I will talk about those in the next video. Uh, I hope you found this one useful and I will see you in the next one.